I'll open the question, the floor up to questions. You cannot ask too personal of a question. As a pilot, if it is a question that is related to the aerodynamics grade, if it's a human factors, if it's just anything else, I'm only here because I fell asleep on the job. All right, so you're not going to hurt my feelings. Yes, sir. How did you deal with, we all make mistakes. You made one that almost killed you. So, uh, you, you know, with, with the confidence that I made this mistake, I'm going to learn for it, from it and not do it again. In other words, did you ever have doubts in your abilities or your capabilities or, you know, could you say, hey, I screwed up. I, how did, how did you move beyond that or get your confidence back, or was that ever an issue? Okay, good question. Um, it's kind of like a football player. If you're a running back, you're going to fumble the ball sometimes. If you're a quarterback, you're going to throw an interception sometimes. About 40% of tactical fighter pilots have probably experienced a blackout or a G-induced loss of conscience. So I knew it was a part of the risk of tactical aviation. Initially, when I got back in the jet, I mean, I, I knew I had G-locked. I knew, okay, that bottom line, it was my fault. I didn't know exactly what led up to it until that six-year point later when I read my safety accident report. And I had gone out and flown and not had any problems with Gs. But there was one point, when you're flying Gs, the, there's, the very worst way to ever pull Gs is a centrifuge. Four Gs in a centrifuge is worse than eight or nine in the airplane. The back seat of the jet is the second worst way to pull G's. And when you're pulling G's defensive BFM, you feel them. When you pull G's offensive BFM, you don't feel them at all. It is so subconscious. I went out in Alaska with a guy who's just an absolute G monster. Um, we were actually fighting in Death Valley on a Nellis deployment. So we were at 4,800 feet, the floor. We could only fight down to 5,000 feet. We were in clean eagles doing a high speed rate fight, full AB. We could sustain 7.8 to 8 Gs in that airplane. And I'm in the back seat. And we, it was him and another guy, and it was, we would go do this, and it's probably one of the dumber things eagle guys do, but we would go have these low altitude rate fights, and it literally is who is going to back off one tenth of a G, and it is the most painful thing in the world and I'm in the back seat, and I rode through this and didn't have a problem with it, and I knew from then on that Gs were never going to be an issue for me. So while it wasn't a huge factor, it was a small boost that gave me my final answer between knowing that I was 40 knots faster on that, G, that secondary turn and riding through that hell for a minute and a half, I knew it was never going to be an issue, and it, it never really did ever become an issue. Answer your question? Yes, sir. So I've sat through a couple of safety briefings in my squadrons over the years where you know you have a stand down, all the pilots get together and you discuss. Here's a class A mishap, break up in the group, discuss it, and then let's go ahead and stand up in front of everybody and talk about it. And um, I had the pleasure of doing one one time where I gave my impression, and then one of the old fours that was transferred to the squadron stuff said, "Well, that was me, and that was my airplane, and that's not really what happened." So when you read your own safety report five years later, what was your impression? I had, let me just say this, there's two reports that come out. There's the safety report, which is privileged. It has all the, the safety information that's not releasable for the public. And that's what I read at the safety center. I should have been given a copy of it, to be honest. And then I had the legal reports. In mine, the legal report and the safety report were really about 90% the exact same. What I didn't have was that very specific data of, of the Gs and the airspeed of what occurred. So mine was pretty, pretty accurate in that sense. There were no big surprises. Now what's been funny is I've sat in lots of briefings throughout my career, physiological briefings, survival school briefings, and I've heard people tell my story, <laughs> not knowing who I was. And, and it's, it's been fun to hear some of the variations. I used to be apparently a lot better looking. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I just got to ask, how do you get through the uh, TSA metal detector? <laughs> you know, actually, before 9-11, it was a problem. They, they would go off on me. They, I don't know what they changed, but it's looking for different things besides just plain. If you take the hand wand, I'll light up on my knees and arms. But uh, the, the normal one, I can go through OK. Yes, sir? I got about 2,000 hours of F-100 type. Talk a little bit about the G-suit, because the G-suit keeps you going. 
So what the G-suit is, is, is it is a garment that we put on, it goes around your waist and it goes down your legs. It has six air bladders, five air bladders, one behind each calf, one on the thighs and one on the abdominal region. And it plugs into the bleed air source on the jet. And it has just a plumb bob weight. And as you start to pull G's, in about three to four G's, it starts to open up an air valve, which puts pressurized air into your G-suit. Now, everybody thinks that a G-suit is what helps you pull G's. What it does is to, to combat G's, I've talked about straining your muscles. Well, the G-suit simply gives you a wall to push those muscles against to make your G-strain more effective. And so as you start to pull G's, you're, you still have to strain. Typically what it does is it gives you an additional 1G addition to your natural resting G-tolerance. So without a G-suit, at 4 G's, I lose half my vision. With a G-suit, I lose half my vision at 5. And the key, something that came out of this mishap was we were still getting lots of G-induced loss of consciousness, and most of them are due to fatigue issues. You get tired of straining for a minute and a half in a, like a high-speed brake bike. So we went to a vest, which was also now compressing your chest, we, which increases the pressure in your lungs, causes the oxygen to jump through the alveoli into your blood faster and more effectively. And it also was taking high pressure air and it was forcing air into your lungs. So now instead of using your muscles to inhale, you had to use your muscles to exhale. You actually could drown on the air going into your lungs if it was just pushed on and left on. The problem with that was over about 10 to 12 years of flying with it, we found that it added so much heat to your body and you were sweating so much that they were starting to lose the benefits of the reduced fatigue <laughs> by increasing the heat fatigue. And so now that what was called the combat edge vest is gone. The F-22 pilots, because now you have an airplane that can sustain 9, 10 Gs all day long, they have an entire suit that is full body. It's not a partial pressure suit, but it's very similar to it. During G's, it starts to inflate the entire body suit. Um, and they have the high pressure breathing as well, assuming they can even breathe in the first place in the F-22. That's another story. Yes, sir. I was at a conversation with your instructor. You know, we, we there's a whole other story. As he got back and landed, they kept tower kept asking him, confirm you're a single ship, confirm you're a single ship. And he thinks the tower is making fun of him because I'm out in the ocean. What the tower was really trying to figure out as he was coming in was, are you bringing a couple other jets back with you? I.e., there was another student out there whose flight lead had now gone to the search and rescue. So when he climbed out of the jet, he literally parked his jet in front of the tower and was running up the tower to kick the guy's butt. And the OG went, nope, 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 I got you, stop. <laughs> and you got him under control. Um, he went on to have a, a real good flying career. He flies for FedEx. We keep in touch occasionally. We keep in touch with the PJ, who, uh, like I say, has the most wonderful, beautiful, uh, well, now she's a grown woman, 19 years old almost. So, yes, sir? How long was your short-term memory and how frustrating was that? I do not remember two days before. I do not remember three days after. Anybody here from the FAA Aeromedical Evaluation Center? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what was it? You mentioned the combat edge vest. Do you also have a combat edge helmet? The helmet is a, it is a combat edge helmet. What the helmet does is there's a small air bladder in the back of the helmet. And when you start to push the high pressure air into your lungs, they realize that it would just simply blow the mask off the face. So what they did is they put a bladder in the back of the helmet. So now when we pump up the legs, we pump up the chest, we now pump up the helmet, which sucks the oxygen mask further onto your, your face. So we did have that. When the vest went away, we kept the combat edge helmet. Yes, sir. Uh, so it, it seems like the ACS 230 has some, uh, I don't know, All right, so his question was, it seems that the ACES-2 has some design deficiencies when it comes to high speed. All right, who here owns the perfect airplane? <laughs> 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 All 
There's no such thing as the perfect woman or the perfect airplane. There's no such thing as the perfect ejection seat. The K-36 seat that the Russians have is an incredible high-speed capable seat. Have you ever sat in it? You don't want to. There's a reason they get shot down. They can't turn around and look behind them either. Kind of real critical whether you're dodging a sand or you're dodging an F-15. Um, it's very heavy. The, F, the ACES-2 seat is a nice lightweight seat. The vast majority of our ejections are below 350 knots, and it has an incredible record. The number one killer of unsuccessful ejections is the pilot makes the decision to eject too late. I don't care if you're wearing a backpack chute in your CJ6 or your T28, when things go to heck, get rid of the airplane earlier. Anybody seen life insurance which gives you your life back? No. <laughs> airplane insurance will probably give you another airplane, all right? Get out of it early. Yes, bud? I think, uh, do you remember seeing that F-18 crash at the Lethbridge? Yeah. Ago? I think that was the only ACES-2 seat in the whole Air Force that was experimental in that particular airplane. And they've got them since, I think, though. But that, that really, because usually the Hornet, that the American Hornets have Martin Bakers. Yes, mm -hmm. But it didn't, and, and that just happened to be one of Leftwich, and it came up like so, and, yeah. and, uh, and he managed to make his... Uh, but what they had to do is, in the, the ejection seat engineers study all these high-speed ejections. We knew in the, in the B-1, for example, it's a low-altitude, high airspeed. It's not, you know, there's been SR-71 guys ejected Mach 3. But guess what? They were doing 180, 200 knots indicated airspeed. It's the indicated, the cue that hurts you. So in the, the B-1, they started to incorporate leg restraints. In the F-22, they actually have netting, which fires up over the elbows and pins the arms in. And they have the same thing that contains the legs due to the high speed. The old Martin Baker seats, whether they were from the F-4 days or even the T-6 Texan II, which I flew, those had leg uh, restraints on around your ankle and it would suck your ankle back in. So those are some things that they've done to increase its capability. Um, you know, you can look back at the Hustler and some of the supersonic SAC airplanes, they had the clamshells that came out in the F-111, the entire cockpit ejected. The, the K-36 C, there's a 750 knot successful ejection out of that Russian K-36 C. Uh, it has big, long stinger antennas that are about eight foot long telescoping rods which shoot out the back and stabilize it. <laughs> what we have to stabilize is when the seat goes up the rail, there's a gigantic gyro which gets powered by the rocket motor and spins this gyro. And it stabilizes the seat at whatever attitude you happen to come out. That, that uh, CF-18 ejection is a great example. They're, they're basically coming out completely horizontal and their seat stabilizes and continues that way instead of starting to turn down. We did design, there's some neat video that shows an ACES-2 that is sitting upside down at about 50 feet and they eject mm -hmm. it and it turns the corner. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this turn right here is so violent on the pilots that it was causing additional injuries. Mm -hmm. But the number of times that you need to be able to eject upside down at 100 feet is very small. Mm -hmm. So there is no perfect design, but it is, I'll, I'll sit in that seat any day, every day. Yes, sir. So the ACES-2 is a zero-zero seat? It is zero-zero. Yeah. So same with all your modern Martin Bakers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate having the opportunity to share this with you. It's a great organization that we have here, and I'm real fortunate to be back in Pacific Northwest and be able to be a part. I appreciate you guys having me here today. Thank you. Cool.